I'm Ari Cohn. I work for the Post Prison Education Program. To my left is Pete Early, who you all have read about, former Washington Post reporter. The lights are super bright. Um, and then um, author of 17 books. I had a really cool thing happen this, today. We were having lunch. And um, Pete mentioned a book that uh, I had not remembered that he wrote that was a textbook, Circumstantial Evidence. And I, I didn't even tell him this, but so like in 2004 when I was at UW, I took a class from Catherine Beckett, and uh, it's called Miscarriages of Justice. And one of the textbooks was Circumstantial Evidence. So Pete was talking about Circumstantial Evidence today at lunch, and, uh, and I'm like, my God, he wrote that too. So, <laughs> uh, so I, I'm going to spend just a few minutes here. Uh, I think everybody knows we, Facebook blocked us from preventing this event. So the last time we were here it was standing room only and literally 611 people. Um, but we were able to promote the event when, when we did it then, and, and Facebook has just blocked it. They decided this was uh, a political issue, which it clearly is not, or maybe it is, but um, as of yesterday, we had, we've spent thousands of dollars trying to promote it with Facebook, and we had 2,200 engagements um, versus the last time we were here, we had 20 or 30,000, and again, 600 people, but thanks for being here. Uh, it's amazing, and we should have a good evening. Um, I want to tell you really quickly my story and how I got involved in, in really passionately caring about people who suffer serious mental illness. In 2010, um, a lady counselor at the Special Offender Unit in Monroe called me up, and I didn't know her. And Melissa, I can't see you out there, but this gal worked for Scott Frakes at the time when he was superintendent over all the prisons. And uh, she said, this man is going to release, and if you don't get involved, he has no chance. And um, she told me his diagnosis was schizoaffective disorder. And to be honest, I'm like a, sort of a poor, dumb country boy from Central Florida, and I didn't, I had never heard that term before. And so I went to Mayo Clinic, I looked it up, and um, was horrified. So for those who don't know, that's really bipolar and schizophrenia wrapped up in one unlucky person's body. And... Um, and it really got my attention. And, 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 and then what happened was it, we kept getting those calls from the Department of Corrections to a point that I, uh, when Cheryl Strange, who's now head of DSHS, was deputy secretary of DSC, I wrote an email to her. I know her really well. And I just, and I was, uh, I can't, I'm not going to use the language I put in the email, but I, I was like, just how many are there? How many men and women coming out of prison of the 700 who release every month, how many suffer serious mental illness? And she guessed it was 100. And she was way, 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 way wrong. So six months later, I was up at Monroe speaking at a graduation in the Washington State Reformatory Unit. And Scott Frakes was there, who's now head of Department of Corrections in Nebraska. And I asked Scott the same question, and he said, he said it's got to be at least 146 and, uh, of the 700 men and women who release every month. And so that, that's a, a pretty big percentage. And I was horrified. I felt, I, I'm like, you know, we're, we're locking people up who need treatment. We've we criminalized mental illness. And so we changed our admissions criteria at the post prison education program. And today, if you will, we help everybody that gets a complete application to us. But if you want monetary assistance, you've got to be diagnosed by the DOC as S code 2345 
or higher, uh, plus be rated high risk to recidivate, or we won't invest money in you, except for in special cases. So the guy that, uh, that DOC called me about in 2010, that first guy that kicked off our journey with mental illness, is this guy. And you can go to the DOC's website, and you can see that he's back in prison now. Uh, we have a talking relationship. We've got permission to use this data. So the Department of Corrections data is uploaded into Salesforce, um, which, and, and that's the database we use. And you can see, um, like, start dates. So his first incarceration, 1994, came out and recidivated. 97 came out in 2001, recidivated, and recidivated, and recidivated, and recidivated. And at all times, he's S code 4, and I'll show you in a minute what that is. And he's, and it's, that's super seriously mentally ill. And, and on the far right, high violent HV, that's high risk to recidivate. So um, for no reason other than the fact that he comes out, of, he came out of poverty in Clark County, a family that has no education, and he's, his diagnosis is schizoaffective disorder, he's spending his entire life in prison. Uh, the data hasn't updated since he went back but he's back in the special offender unit right now. Um, that's, so that's kind of our journey. Now I've got to learn how to use a MacBook, which I don't know diddly about, and uh, switch over to a PowerPoint, and then I'm gonna turn you over to Pete. So um, I think from my standpoint, the biggest lie I ever told is years of listening to the Washington State Legislature act like Recidivism is some mystical, unsolvable crime. That's a lie. Uh, w the last time we were audited, UW looked at our work with 1,746 men and women. Uh, those men and women meet the admissions criteria that I just described to you, and they are 92.13% successful, right? So recidivism isn't some unsolvable, mystical thing, when the legislators tell you it is, they're lying. Tell them I said so. Um, here's, here's S code one, two, three, four, five, and anybody wants this PowerPoint, I can email it to you, but S, S code one is basically healthy. That's a DOC determination, they're saying you're mentally ill, you're not mentally ill, you're stable. S code two is you're mentally ill, but you're stable. So maybe you were three, uh, but you went off your meds and, 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 and so on. But so S code two is you're stable. S code three is the higher the number goes, the worse it gets. S code four is where Jeremy Polston was. S code five, we, most cases probably can't even apply to our program. Um, but We've worked with a lot of people who are S code two, three, and four, and they're successful if you just give them help, if you just assist them in some way. Are you? Oh, you're wonderful. Uh oh, that. Yeah. Oh, yay! <laughs> if y'all think town hall isn't great, uh, so now I got to figure this out. Come back. Um, let's see if down works. No. Uh, okay, so I, I just want to show you how bad the Department of Corrections work is and how many people are caught up in this mess. So this is DOC data set, prisoner release year by year over a 15 year period. If you look at the column that's S code zero, Somehow, in 15 years, 22,000 men and women went through male and female intake and didn't get classified. That's almost immoral. It's, it's outrageous because somebody who's suffering schizophrenia could have gone through male or female intake and been placed in a wrong prison where there's nobody there that knows how to treat them. That knows, no, nobody can prescribe, nobody can counsel. Uh, and, and so like letting 22,000 people go through male and female intake without classifying is outrageous. S code one, I already told you, uh, healthy. Two, three, four, five on this chart, total 34%. So 
So at the point we got this DOC data, we were thinking 34% of Washington's prisoners suffer serious mental illness. And that's when I really started thinking in terms of the fact that we've criminalized mental illness. Uh, more recently, within the last year, we got data from DOC that shows that that 34% is 39%. And if you go back to the 22,000 that weren't classified, you know some percentage of them, if classified, would have been S code 2, 3, 4, or 5. So it's really likely, it's certainly not impossible, that, that we're closer to having 50% 45% of the prisoners, the people that we've got locked up, uh, suffering serious mental illness. And then, the, and then the question becomes, you know, what are the alternatives? Um, this, and I'm gonna move through these really quick and turn it over to Pete. Uh, this chart, uh, DOC has measured recidivism two ways. One is readmission, so that's you return to prison with felony convictions, but you're not time barred. So it's any time during your life. Recidivism is you return to prison with felony convictions within three years of your release. This chart shows uh, readmission. And you can see in 2012, it crossed 50% and it went to 53%. So the state of Washington is doing such a I always have this trouble when I'm like on radio and public media and you can't, and the SEC will take somebody's license away if I use the, the F word or something, but it's like, um, it's like this, this slide just proves irrevocably and Jay Inslee and Tim Orms being Jeannie Darnell, none of them can, can, can argue against this data that the state of Washington is failing. They're failing the people that we're locking up, they're failing their families, and they're failing people in the communities to whom they promise safe communities. So consistently, since 2012, more than half the people who come out of prison go back. Um, you know, what we do is, uh, we, it's so simple, we meet the legitimate frugal needs of people at the time that they're released. Uh, the lights blind me a little bit, so I don't know if he's up here, but a guy released from Airway Heights about two weeks ago, Shalisha, I don't know if she's up here either, but she was downstairs. At, yeah, yes, yeah, and she'll be on the panel in a minute. Um, Shalisha worked really hard with Vincent for months and months and months prior to his release. We went up to Airway Heights, we interviewed him, and then the DOC released him into nothingness. I mean, he walked into our office Saturday afternoon at 4.04, two Saturdays ago, in khakis, in a plastic box with six years of paperwork, and no money, because he'd been on a bus since forever that morning from Airway Heights. No job, no housing, no groceries, no nothing. Uh, and today he's in, he, we, he's in Seattle Central, he's a student, he lives in an Oxford house in Shoreline, he's clean and sober, he's well dressed, he has groceries in the cabinet, uh, and, and I think he's on the way to being a, 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 an amazing success. So we just meet the legitimate frugal needs, and that's the answer. And if you do that, then 92.13% of the time, according to the University of Washington, people will be successful. With that, I'm going to uh, tell you, uh, a quick story about how I met Pete early, and uh, and then in 2012, in 2011, UW came to us the honors program, and they wanted to have a post-prison education program class, and um, uh, and I, I thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever heard of. And so in 2012, winter quarter, they met, they matched 30 honors program students with 10 of our students, and I can tell you like. One of the students that we put in there, 21 years for first degree murder. Another guy, a uh, uh, Latino guy, gang history, 13 years for murder. People with serious crimes, and, w and they stood toe to toe in the honors program with these 30 honors students. Um, we wrote the syllabus for that class, and we were two years past when we had met Jerry, Jeremy Olston through, through DOC, and we were really focused on mental illness. And, the person UW assigned to be like the test giver and all uh, for that curriculum that quarter, she was like opposed to having a, a week of the, of the quarter be on mental illness. And so I told Jenna Melman, who ran the program for me at the time, like, okay, shut it down. They can go to hell. If, if we're not gonna talk about mental illness, we won't be there. 
And so they backed up. And then it was decided that the book we would use was crazy. Um, and, and so we, did, we had a week of mental illness, and Cheryl Strange was the lecturer, by the way. And that's when I met this guy named Pete Early, who's going to take it from here. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I know, but I... Here, here, here comes help. Okay. <laughs> Good evening. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. A uh, special call out to NAMI. I'm a lifetime member of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and it was so nice meeting so many advocates before we started this. Can I, I, can I move that so I can get this one? And thank you, Ari, for, uh, for inviting me out. There we go. And thank you for coming out. I'm the parent of a son with serious mental illness. What does that mean? What does it feel like? It means that I know what it's like to see someone who I've known from the moment of their birth and not recognize them, to see a stranger in my son's body, completely alien to me. What does it mean? It means I'm the subject of whispers. An apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You see someone with mental illness, as one mental health professional told me before he found out I had a son with mental illness, oh, just look at the parents and, and you'll see what's, what's wrong and what's causing this. What does it mean? It means that I've had to call the police on my son. I've watched my son get tasered. I've watched my son being taken to a police station, hogtied with his hands and feet chained behind his back and officers making fun of him and egging him on while he talked about how he was gonna save Natalie Portman. What does it mean? It means that his brothers and sisters have accused me of, of favoring him of enabling him, of protecting him, coddling him, and experts saying, oh, just let him hit rock bottom. What does it mean? It means I've had people who don't believe in psychiatry and say it's a social construct tell me I'm torturing my child by trying to get him treatment. What does it mean to be the parent of an adult son with a mental illness? It means trying to convince your son and I'm very fortunate because my son reacts well to medication. Trying to convince him to take medication and then having an insurance company say, oh, we're not going to pay for that drug, or even worse, having a psychiatrist say to him, well, I'll give you that medication, but it's a placebo, and I've never known it to help anyone else. What does it mean? It means having your heart broken as you hold your sobbing son in your arms, and him saying to you, I just want to be normal, Dad, and having everyone around him say, you're not normal, we will not rent you an apartment, we will not give you a job, we will not let you date anyone we know because you have a mental illness. I know every one of those feelings because I've experienced them with my son, Kevin. My first hint that something was wrong was when Kevin was in college. He was attending the Pratt Institutes in New York, and I live in the Washington, D.C. area, and we called every Sunday, and on this particular Sunday, he said to me, Dad, Dad, food doesn't taste good. I said, what? And he hung up the phone, and I called him back, and he said, Dad, Dad, I think I took five homeless people to breakfast this morning, but I'm not sure, and I said, well, tell me, and he hung up the phone, and I called him back, and I said, what's going, Dad, Dad, I'm not sure that I'm not dreaming this. I can't tell the difference between reality and my dreams. Well, I immediately raced to New York and my wife Patty called and we actually found a psychiatrist willing to see us. And I took him over there. My son went willingly and we went over and the psychiatrist talked to him for a few minutes and he came out and he said, Mr. Early, if you're lucky, your son is using drugs. And if he's not, he has a mental illness. Lucky if my son is using drugs? Well, blood test showed he wasn't using drugs. So that doctor called us in and he said, look, <clears throat> I'm not one of these people who's gonna sugarcoat this. Your son has an incurable illness, bipolar disorder. He will never get better. He will have to take strong medications the rest of his life. They will make him gain weight. They will probably keep him from getting a job. Don't even think about getting married and he may end up homeless, he could be on the street, and oh yeah, 
People with mental illness die 15 to 25 years before everyone else. Can you imagine how I felt when I left that office and I turned to Kevin and he looked at me and he goes, Dad, that guy's crazy. You know, my wife was recently diagnosed with kidney cancer. What did we do? We looked at all the odds, the things, and we said, we're going to be, well, my son did the same thing. He said, I'm not going to be one of those homeless people on the streets. I don't have a mental illness. Well, he took medication, it helped him, and after about two months, he stopped taking it, and I was so ignorant, I thought, well, you have a headache, you take aspirin, and, you know, when it goes away, you quit taking it. This was a failed opportunity to educate me and also to engage my son. Flash forward, 12 months later, I get a frantic call from his older brother. He says, come quick, come quick. Kevin is crazy. And I drove to New York, and my son had been wandering around the street for five days. He'd barely slept. He'd hardly eaten. He was convinced that God had him on a special mission. And I convinced him to get in the car, and I drive as fast as I can down to Fairfax County. And during that car ride, he would laugh one minute, and he began sobbing the next, and I pleaded with him to take his medication. He screamed, pills are poison, leave me alone. And we got to the emergency room, and the intake nurse is rolling her eyes while Kevin's telling her about it, how God has him on this special mission. And then we were shown to a room away from everyone else to wait all by ourselves, and we waited, and we waited, and we waited, and after four hours, my son said, there's nothing wrong with me, I'm gonna leave. And I said, hang on, son, hang on, and I literally went out and grabbed a doctor. And I will never forget how that doctor came in that room. He came in with his hands up as if he was surrendering, and he said, I'm sorry, Mr. Early, I can't help your son. I said, you haven't even examined him. And he said it didn't make any difference. At that time in Virginia, the law was very clear. Unless a person posed an immediate, imminent danger to themselves or others, they couldn't be required to undergo any kind of treatment. And the nurse had told him that my son thought all pills were poison. And the fact we'd been sitting there for four hours meant that there was no imminent danger. So he looked at me and he says, you know, Mr. Lee seemed like a concerned father. You bring him back after he tries to hurt you or kill someone else. Another missed chance at engagement, at getting us in. Well, I took my son home, and during the next 48 hours, I saw him get sicker and sicker. At one point, he had tinfoil wrapped around his head to keep the CIA from reading his thoughts. He slipped out of my house. He slipped out. He broke into a stranger's house. Thank goodness no one was home. It was Labor Day weekend. He broke in to take a bubble bath. It took five police officers to get him out. And all of a sudden... My son had become a criminal justice statistic. One of the 2.2 million people with serious mental illnesses who are booked in our jails every year. One of the 367,000 with serious mental illness sitting in our jails and prisons. One of the more than 1 million on probation every year. 40% of persons with serious mental illness will have an encounter, a serious encounter with law enforcement. 49% of police shootings involve persons with serious mental illness. Persons with serious mental illness are 16 times more likely to be shot by the police. They stay in jails and prisons four to eight times longer, charged with identical crimes as someone else. They have a higher likelihood while they're in jail of being charged with other crimes. And persons with serious mental illness cost seven to 10 times more than anyone else. And the recidivism rate is 15% higher than the national average, 85% recidivism. And I'm not an expert on Seattle. I'm not an expert on Washington State. But I did a little digging as a reporter. And what I read was, if you have a breakdown right now in Washington State, like my son has, the chances of you ending up in jail or getting help are three to one in favor of going to jail. In November 2016, your state conducted an exhaustive study entitled Diversion of People with Mental Illness in Washington State. What did they find? Quote, Data suggests that people with mental illness are cycling in and out of Washington's criminal justice system, many of them without getting treatment. Quote, when people with mental illness are arrested, it's usually not for a violent behavior, but low-level nuisance crimes like shoplifting, trespassing, disorderly conduct, and theft, and if they've been arrested before for technical violations. Quote, 
Once they are in jail, they are vulnerable to intimidation and assault. They may act out or break jail rules because the jail environment has exacerbated the symptoms and this behavior prolongs their incarceration. Well, what happened to my son and those kind of statistics made me want to do something. So I decided I'd go to my son and I said, I'm thinking about writing a book about you. And Kevin looked at me and he said, who'd want to read that? I said, no, I'm going to find a jail far away from Fairfax County because I don't want to risk irritating a judge or a prosecutor. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to follow people through the system out into the streets to see what happens to them. And then I'll come back and I'll talk to the judge and the prosecutor and defense attorney and the correctional officers and the police and the parents. And he looked at me and he said, dad, if it helps someone else, tell my story. Well, I got talked my way into the LA County Jail, Twin Towers. I lasted two days before they threw me out claiming I was violating HIPAA. The truth was they didn't want me to see what was going on there. I tried Chicago next. They said no. Rikos Island, they said no. I tried Baltimore. They said no. I tried Washington, D.C., my hometown, and they said hell no. And I ended up going to Miami-Dade because of a judge down there who said, I want you to see what's going on in my jail. Let me take you there. The ninth floor, Miami-Dade Correctional Center. It, suicide wing, 19 cells. It's a U-shaped cell block. The officers walk up and down the center. 19 cells, plexiglass flunch. And when you looked in those cells, you saw men completely naked in cells that had nothing else in them. Cells built for two or three people with four or five people in them. Because the plexiglass blocked the air conditioning, there were bone kill chilling cold, but there was no blankets. There were no blankets. And I'm going to show you a video of this place, and you will see that people on medication thirsty. It's an old jail. The water system broke down, so you see people drinking out of toilets. And I heard the normal sounds of men coughing and spitting and talking and jail doors closed. But when you listen closer, you could hear the asylum sound, someone screaming in an unseen tormentor. And then I heard a thud, thud, thud. Then louder, thud, thud, thud. Quicker, thud, thud, thud. It was an inmate smashing his forehead in the plexiglass. I ain't crazy, he screamed. Well, then quit acting like you are. The correctional officers who worked here called it the forgotten floor, and I thought, oh, that's because the inmates, and, and I spent 10 months there, I found out, no, it was, they were also talking about themselves. Not one of these correctional officers had any training to work with people with mental illness, and when I got to know them better, they all admitted to me that they were troublesome employees, their bosses wanted to get them fired, so they sent them to work with the crazies because it was the worst assignment in the jail. My tour guide was Dr. Joseph Poitier, a fabulous psychiatrist. He said to me, Pete, people think you get arrested, you get help. We don't help people in jail, we're not a hospital. I went with him on his morning rounds. There were 92 inmates on the ninth floor. His rounds took us 19 minutes. You do the math, you'll see we talked to each person 12 seconds. But Pete, these are criminals. They deserve to be locked up. Oh, do they? Let me introduce you to Al San Collier, classic case, schizophrenia, the kind of person who used to be in a state hospital. Now she was back in the community. That's fabulous, but look where she lived. She lived in a cardboard box container behind a restaurant. When I checked her record, I'd found out she'd been arrested 10 times in the last four years and never had gotten any kind of help. And this time she was arrested because she was walking down the street and she saw an older woman waiting for a bus and she screamed, stop stealing my thoughts. And she ran up and she shoved the older woman, not hard enough to knock her over, but she shoved her and then went running away. And well-meaning witnesses came up and said, get that woman arrested. You get her arrested, she'll get help. Well, that's not what Alice Ann Collier received. Florida is unique because so many people retire there. They can charge any crime against someone over the age of 65 as a felony if they wish. And because Alice Ann Collier had shoved two other people at bus stops, she was charged as a felony and her third strike rule, which meant she faced a mandatory five years in prison. But when she was brought before the judge to be put on trial, he said, I can't put that, she's not competent, and you have to be competent in our country to be put on trial. You go to the state hospital in Chattahoochee and get made competent. 
Get made competent is not the same as treatment. Every day, Alison Collier was taken into a room and she was shown three chairs. Now, one chair was written judge and another one defense attorney and a third one prosecutor. And when Alice Ann Collier could tell her keepers who sat in each chair, a checkbox was made off, she was deemed competent and she was sent back to the judge. Well, of course, she wasn't competent. And the judge looked down and said, I sent you off to Chattahoochee, you have made competent. Go back to Chattahoochee. When I discovered Alice Ann Collier in that jail, she'd been traveling between Chattahoochee and the jail 1,151 days, more than three years, and she'd never been brought on trial. Now, I'm a reporter. I got my little pen, I have a pencil, and I went running over to the prosecutor. Look what I found. Look what I found. And they told me with absolutely no embarrassment that they knew what they were doing with Alice Ann Collier. In fact, they planned to keep her for five years, which was the statutory maximum they could without putting her on trial. Why? She was dangerous, medications didn't seem to help her become stable, and there was no safe place, no treatment beds, no facilities, no place in the entire state of Florida to help her. So they were keeping her on that bus, riding her back and forth to keep her off the street. She was typical. I'm not talking about Hannibal Lecter serial killers. I'm talking about people with serious mental illnesses, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and persistent and major depression. Let me tell you about April Hernandez, same age as my son. I found about her because the correctional officers came up and said, you should get that woman, you should look at that woman's case. She was framed. I said, framed? Yeah, she was framed. Who framed April Hernandez? Her own parents had conspired with relatives to frame her for stealing a car. Why would parents frame their own child? Because she had schizophrenia, she was homeless, she was living on the streets of South Beach where she'd been gang raped twice and beaten up three times by teenagers who thought it was hilarious to beat up homeless people and there was nothing anyone could do because she was not considered a danger to herself or others and there was no outreach on those streets trying to help her. Now what's interesting about her case is when she was a teenager she began using drugs and everybody thought, oh, that's why she's doing that. And it was only when she was correctly diagnosed as having a co-occurring both drug addiction and mental health problem, that they understood what was really going on. And we know that 40% of persons with bipolar disorder have serious mental illness and have a co-occurring problem, and 70% of our people who are in jail and prisons have co-occurring problems. Let's talk about the last person I'm gonna mention, Freddie Gilbert. And I saw several favorite Freddie Gilberts when I walked from the hotel over here tonight. A Miami study found that in a population of two million at any given time, there were 1,700 people who were living on the streets or they were homeless, sleeping in cars. But that same study found that of those 1,700 people, most were able to move through our social system into some kind of housing, except except for 507 individuals. They are the chronic homeless. They are always homeless. And Freddie Gilbert was one of those. They are always homeless. Every one of them has been arrested more than once, and every one of them had a co-occurring drug and alcohol problem. When I met Freddie Gilbert, he was so sick, he could not speak. He stood in his cell naked, and they controlled him by offering him sandwiches as if he were a dog performing for treats. And when I checked his record, I discovered Gilbert had been in and out of that jail more than a dozen times that year alone. But he was always charged with misdemeanors, and because of that, he could not be admitted into a treatment program. And he was just simply caught in the revolving door, jail streets, jail streets, jail streets. After my book was published, the University of Southern Florida's Mental Health Institute followed 97 people like Freddie Gilbert, people like the ones you see on your street. They followed them for five years. Every one of them had schizophrenia. Everyone was homeless. Now listen to this. These 97 individuals were arrested 2,200 times, spent 27,000 days in jail, 13,000 days in crisis stabilization units and emergency rooms, 13,000 days in emergency rooms. They cost the community $13 million, and not one of them ever got any better. 
But Pete, you wrote your book in, what, 2006, 2007? Surely things have gotten better. Yeah, they have. But let's not fool ourselves. Last year, Hampton Roads, Virginia, J. Shamil Mitchell, 24-year-old, African-American, he gets arrested. He has, he has schizophrenia. He gets arrested. He gets taken to the jail. His paperwork is sent to the state hospital. There are no beds available. So he sits in that jail. And people forget about him until 101 days later when his body is found dead in his cell, walls covered with feces. What did J. Shamil die from? He died from wasting away syndrome. He was literally starved to death by guards who thought they'd punish him by keeping food from him. Even though he was seen every day by a nurse, nothing was done. She noted in her records that he had gone from 178 pounds, he'd lost 46 pounds, and yet no alarm bells were raised. What was J. Shamil Mitchell's crime? He had taken $5.05 worth of snacks from a 7-Eleven. How do we get in the situation where jails and prisons, as Ari said, have become our new mental health asylums? The biggest reason is we do not adequately fund community-based treatment. Not everybody in Miami is in the jail if you have a serious mental illness. There were 4,500 people with serious mental illness, the kind who used to be locked up in state prisons back in the community. There are 4,500 of them when I did my book. Let's look at where they lived. They lived in 650 boarding homes, assisted living facilities. That's great. We got them out there living in the... Let's look at those 650 homes. Do you know that 400 of them, only 250 of them, had passed the state licensing requirements to operate as a boarding home. In other words, in the other 400, if you tried to put somebody who didn't have a mental illness in that place, it would have been against the law. They were granted waivers because they needed beds. One of the homes I visited had a hole in the roof. Rain came through. Medications were scattered on the kitchen table. The, uh, the person who ran the home only spoke Spanish. None of the tenants spoke Spanish. Meals were rice and beans. There was no treatment. There was no case management. All the people did was sat in front of a black and white TV smoking and watching TV. And I would argue in these cases, we haven't improved these people's lives. We're just hiding them better. Well, it's easy for me to criticize these slumlords. Let's do a little digging. When I did my research, every one of those people operated that home got $29.90 per patient per day. $29.90, take care of all their needs. Now, you can tell I'm from Washington because when I travel, I put my dog in the Dulles Executive Pet Center. They charge me $36 a day to walk my dog, feed my dog, give my dog its medicine. In other words, we're paying $6 a day more to take care of my dog than what we're paying people in Miami to take care of people with schizophrenia. That's why I call my book crazy. I'm not talking about people like my son. I'm talking about a disjointed, underfunded system that waits for people to get to stage four of their illness and then cobbles together a system of scraps. Because our mental health care system can't meet our needs, we're relying on the criminal justice system to solve it. Your state has become a national leader in police training. In 2015, your legislature passed a law that said all police officers must have training in how to deal with individuals with mental crisis. Two months ago, Seattle hosted the International Crisis Intervention Team Training, CIT convention, right here in your town. In addition to police training, 28 of your 39 counties have created problem-solving courts to try to divert people who are sick out into treatment rather than putting them through the criminal justice system. Remember that 2016 report about you? It quote, diversion has the potential to cut criminal justice costs, reduce recidivism, provide effective mental health treatment, and represent a more humane response. Unfortunately, Washington counties, law enforcement agencies, jails, courts, and health care providers do not have sufficient funds to divert people into treatment. Now look, what are we really talking about? Let's use some common sense. 
If I had a broken arm, I wouldn't call up the Seattle Police Department and say, hey, can you come fix it? If I needed heart surgery, I wouldn't call up your sheriff and ask her to come and do a heart transplant. And if I had nasty, nasty hemorrhoids, I wouldn't call up one of your judges and say, hey, judge, would you come over and take a look at this? So why are we depending on the police and the sheriff and judges to deal with what should be a community-based problem? We can't arrest ourselves out of this. If you want to reform our system, you have to take law enforcement and collaborate with community care. And the first place you got to start is with housing. How can you get better if you don't have decent housing and a roof over it? Then you have, do you know in progressive communities in California, the hospitals are actually paying for housing to keep people like Freddie Gilbert from recycling through their uh, emergency rooms? You need to wake up and you can't understand unless you want to fix your system, unless you want to talk about jobs, giving people opportunities. You can't fix it unless you want to talk about getting mental health professionals out in rural areas. You shouldn't have to drive five miles to 500 miles to see a therapist. You can't talk about mental health recovery unless you want to talk about transportation and getting people to those jobs and housing. You can't talk about it unless you want to talk about drug and alcohol treatment programs. You can't talk about it unless you want to talk about PTSD, 21 veterans a day dying from mental illness, untreated, taking their own lives. Did you know for the last three years, more police officers have ended their own lives because of PTSD than have died in the line of duty? And you can't talk about it unless you want to talk about social connectivity and giving people meaning in their life and having peers, people with mental illness, help people, and having clubhouses. And you can't talk about it unless you want to talk about giving people hope. That's right, hope. Writer Hal Lindsey said it best, man can live 40 days without food, three days without water, eight minutes without air, and one second without hope. Well, how do I know that this is the answer? How do I know that collaboration with the police and community services and getting proper funding is the answer? Because let's go back to Miami. After my book was published, the judge down there, Lifeman, took it to the television station. I'm going to show you the video. And they did a big series and people have big hearts and they saw what was going on and they passed a bond issue. And it took him until last year to close down that jail. But he replaced it with a drop-in center and he had crisis intervention team trained police officers. It used to be if you spit at a policeman in Miami, you got charged with a felony assault. He changed it so the police officers now don't even charge someone with a mental illness if they shove them. That's incredible. And what has happened since he's closed that place down? Arrests have decreased from 118,000 to 56,000 annually. Recidivism dropped 50%. The jail population dropped from 7,300 to 4,000. And Miami actually was able to close one of its jails, saving $12 million. My goal is zero intercept. In Phoenix right now, they have what's called an air traffic plan, where you call a number, and that person is a trained professional and says, oh, you need to get this person immediately to this hospital. Oh, we can send out a mobile crisis response team. Oh, you just need to get this person to therapy. We'll arrange it for you. Voiding police contact altogether. How do I know collaboration works? I know because of my son, Kevin. For six years, my son was in and out of hospitals, in and out of getting arrested, tasered by the police. The last time he got sick was on Thanksgiving, and he could tell, I could tell he was off his meds, and he ran out and he jumped in the car, and he went shooting off, and I called, and I called, and I called, and finally he answered, I said, where are you going? And he said, I'm going to heaven. Well, that's not reassuring to a father. Four hours later, he called me. He'd run out of gas in North Carolina. And I said, well, no, I'll come get you. No, don't, don't, don't come, Dad. <clears throat> well, go to a gas station. I'll give you a credit card. No, Dad, you don't understand. You don't understand. If the voices are telling me, if I step out of this car, I will die. Now, we all know that's ridiculous. But how do you know you're here tonight? How do you know you're listening to me? How do you know you live in Seattle? You know because your mind is telling you, and I'm telling you right now, if all of us decided we'd die if we left town hall, we'd get to know each other better than we'd ever want to because we'd stay right here. So I did what no father should do. I arranged for my son 
to get gasoline, drive completely psychotic up at 95, went off the road twice, luckily was not stopped. And when he got home, I said to him, look, I've talked to all these experts, and they told me that I should be your partner, not your parent. Work with you, work with the healthy part of your brain to try, what do you want to do? I want to go in a safe house, Dad. I don't want to take medication. I just, take me to this safe house. So I said, okay, so I drove him to a safe house. I checked him in. He got up that night and he took off all his clothes because everyone knows when you take off all your clothes, you become invisible. And he went walking down the street. But listen to what happened this time. This time, a crisis intervention team officer saw him and he came up and he said, hey, buddy, uh, you're walking naked down the street. That's not really that safe. Let's go over and get you checked out in an emergency room. Don't handcuff me. That's when I got tasered. I, I'm not a criminal. Okay, the officer used his discretion and had him get in the back of the squad car. And then that officer said to him, what kind of music do you like to listen to? Oh, I like rap music. He turned it on to a rap station. When they got to the emergency room, my son actually said, man, this is better than a taxi ride. That officer then didn't leave. He took him inside. And when that doctor said to him, well, walking down the street naked is, uh, you know, that's not a sign of dangerousness, the officer actually said to him, really? Dr. Smith, I'm going to look up where you live and drop him off on your front lawn. All of a sudden, my son was admitted into that hospital. And then a miracle happened. He got a case manager, a fabulous woman named Cindy Anderson. And she said to him, why don't you like taking your meds? And he said, I've gained 40 pounds. I feel sluggish. I can't drink. I can't have sex. And she said, we're going to get you to talk to a psychiatrist. Do you know of my son's seven psychiatrists? Only two have ever bothered to learn anything about him except his name and his symptoms. And that's because they're going to get paid for a 15-minute insurance med check and shove that person out the door for a social worker. To, but treating the mind also requires treating the heart and treating a person like a person, not just some object to be moved along assembly line. And he got a doctor who talked to him, and they became friends, and the doctor worked with him, and they got a medication that he didn't mind taking because he didn't even think he had any side effects. And then the case manager said to him, you shouldn't live with your father. Now, I didn't know quite how to take that. But he said, and I thought, this is silly. I have a big house. He could, no, he's too old to live with you. He needs his own place. So she moved him into housing first, two guys with schizophrenia. And I was shocked. I was shocked at how much that made him proud. He had to pay 30% of his income. Even if he didn't have any, he had to pay it. But it gave him respect. He was an adult. And then she said to him, what are you going to do with your life? Well, what can I do? I have a mental illness. Knock it off. Control the illness. Don't let it control you. So he got a job. He was the grocery or the Home Depot guy who picked up carts. My son with a college education, walking around Home Depot, picking up carts. And he got depressed because all his friends were moving on with their lives and, and doing so much better and having families, and here he was picking up carts. And one day she came by that store, his case manager said, Kevin, you're doing fantastic. And he thought she was mocking. He said, no, come to my group, come see other people. So he came, and he realized he really was. And he went from being someone who needed help to someone who actually was helping other people. And he said, this is fantastic. And she said, I have a perfect program for you. It's called Peer to Peer a person with mental illness helping people with mental illness. Today, my son is a certified peer-to-peer -peer counselor. He works for Arlington County, and let me brag on him. A guy over 300 pounds, schizophrenia, hadn't been out of his parents' basement for weeks, months. My son went over, started talking to him, and they related, and after a while, my son got him to get out. They went to McDonald's, not my first choice but they got him out of that house. Now that's not a big deal unless that's your son. Today, Kevin and his mother are buying a home together. He's paying taxes and paying and complaining about that. And he's working full time and attending graduate school to be a mental health technician. So don't you dare tell me people with mental illness can't get better. I've seen it with my own eyes. So how do we make this happen? 
There's only one answer. You look to your left and then you look to your right. I'm going to ask you this question. Who will demand that we stop locking up our loved ones with serious mental illness when their only real crime is they got sick? Who will demand that people with serious mental illness be given opportunities and not stigmatized? Who will demand that insurance companies and our healthcare system treat broken minds the same way they treat broken bodies? Who will insist that prisoners with serious mental illness receive humane treatment and not kept locked up for years in solitary confinement that we know makes mental illnesses worse and we just had a new study that shows people locked up in serious, with serious mental illness who locked up in solitary confinement die 15 years before their peers. And one of the worst offenders is our federal government, the Federal Bureau of Prisons. It holds people with serious mental illness in isolation, not for days, weeks, or even months, but for years. Federal prisoners were confined an average of 896 days, 29 months and last year in solitary confinement. And incredibly, 13% of those people who were held for 29 consecutive months in isolation were released right from isolation back into the community without any treatment or help. That's wrong. Who will fight for the homeless, psychotic man on your streets, the teen who's cutting herself, the college student hearing voices, the woman standing on the edge of a bridge about to jub? Will you? Margaret Mead said it best, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. I grew up in a small town in Oklahoma. My dad was a minister, and right there I've told you a lot. Because what that means is every Wednesday and Sunday I got dragged to church. And I got really, really good at listening to my dad speak and going like this and not hearing a word he was saying in that sermon. But there's always one story he told that got my attention. And that's because it's about a woman who's having sex. They're in the Bible. You just got to know where to look for them, okay? A woman is caught in adultery. It's always the women in the Bible who are get caught in adultery. And she's dragged in front of this mob, and they're picking up stones. They're going to kill her. They're going to stone her. And we read that the teacher picks up a stone, and he says, Let ye who's never sinned throw that very first stone. And we read people, put down the rocks, because all of us have sinned. All of us have done things we're ashamed of. My friend Brian Stevenson, a fabulous law lawyer in Alabama, talks about stone catchers, people who stand between the angry mobs and catch those stones until other people can be strong enough to join them. And it's the stone catchers who give me hope because right now we live in a society that doesn't want to put down those stones. They want to lock people up, throw away the key. I am the parent of an adult son with a serious mental illness. What's that mean? It means seeing my son, Kevin, give him not a second chance, but a third and a fourth and a fifth, sticking with him until he was engaged and embraced his recovery. Being the parent of an adult son with a serious mental illness means learning about resilience and the human spirit. It means learning from my son, becoming his partner as well as his parents, watching him succeed. What does it mean to be the parent of a son with a serious mental illness? Our journey has given us a purpose in our lives, a passion for trying to help others and advocate. And I am a fortunate father. I have a son I am proud of. And my goal is that other people, other sons and parents can get the same kind of help Kevin's received. That's what I want. That's what you can help me achieve. So thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for being a stone catcher. You can make a difference. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to show you a short video because I don't know how many of you have ever been in jail, and I'm not going to ask. So I need the computer set up. I want you to see I want you to see what the Miami jail was like when I went there. And don't kid yourself. You can walk into most jails across the United States today and you'll see very similar things happening. Two, three things I want to mention. First, when the jail was told that Judge Leifman was going to send a film crew in, they painted it. 
The second thing they did was they gave everybody a Ferguson gown that it's like an umpire suit you can't rip because they didn't want them naked. That's how they responded to this. And the only other thing I'm going to mention is you'll hear them talking about the 16 bed rule. It's the IMD where because we wanted to close down state hospitals, we said you cannot put anybody in a facility that's bigger than 16 beds. And finally, you'll notice that I once had brown hair. So here we go. A crisis at a county jail is causing an uproar tonight. CBS4 exposed the truth about what's happening on the ninth floor of the Miami Day Detention Center. Inmates awaiting trial are locked up there in conditions that a grand jury recently compared to a scene out of a horror movie. Overcrowding at this jail has been a problem for decades. Nearly 30 years ago, the federal government sued local authorities demanding change. But the excuse then is the same as it is now. There's simply no help available. Well, CBS 4's chief I-Team investigator, Michelle Gillen, joins us now. And Michelle, this story has shocked us all. Time for the public saying time to be done with excuses. From phone calls to emails, message to me since last night, you have responded with outrage and shock to learn about conditions in a jail in the heart of our community. How can this be tolerated, you ask? Well, so often it's been said, as Rob just said, there's no money, there's no option, and there's no help. But it's there. Tonight we return to the forgotten floor. Amid screams of a man who thinks he is Batman, the men on floor nine, barefoot and shivering, stripped and naked, all suffering from mental illnesses, paint and frigid air pumped into cells sealed with plexiglass. You can't treat human beings this way. Bodies are strewn across the floors, cells designed to hold one inmate. In this one, there's three inmates in a cell for one. There is no room, and during our visit, no water. The, the, the water's not working. The water's not working. He's drinking so away. He's drinking so away. He's drinking so away. And in the most dreaded cell, the wrists and ankles of suicidal inmates are shackled to a gurney. Look back at the 1700s. People with mental disorders were thrown into jails and prisons. They, they were not given heat. They don't need heat. They're mentally ill. They were kept naked in cells. Now zoom forward to 2006, Miami, ninth floor. They're treated the same way. How can that be possible? Pete Early is an award-winning author and former reporter for the Washington Post. In 2004, he spent a year documenting conditions at the Miami-Dade Pretrial Detention Center the downtown jail. I found Miami's jail to be horrific. Uh, it was really like stepping back into medieval times. It's morally incomprehensible. Dr. Joseph Portier is chief psychiatrist at the facility. So you've got nowhere to send these folks who do need real treatment. We don't. Unfortunately, we don't. I mean, we basically have closed all the state hospitals in this country, and we've transferred people from state hospitals to jails. Perhaps no one is more outraged in this community over these conditions than Miami-Dade judge Steve Lightman. He had been credited with Herculean efforts to keep inmates with mental illnesses who commit minor crimes out of jail and in treatment. But dollars for treatment, he says, have dried up, and so record numbers of inmates with mental illnesses are now housed here. So they're just trying to keep the lid on so it doesn't explode up here and when you get four and five people with serious mental illness in a, a small cell 24 hours seven days a week it's going to explode every second of the day we are behind these doors they feed us through this hole we've stripped their dignity away from them kate hale veteran community advocate and director of the mental health association of dade county if we had this kind of care and treatment in the in the dade county animal shelter People would be up in arms, but nobody wants to look. And therein lies the danger. William Weaver Sr. was caring for his 40-year-old son, Bill, at home. A son, he says, suffered from schizophrenia, but functioned well for decades until his medicine was changed. Then one night, according to police records, he attacked his elderly father, who called police and urged them to arrest his son, hoping this would trigger treatment. Because he was under the false idea that if he got arrested, he'd get treatment. Bill ended up locked up in a cell on floor nine 
for several months. He was waiting to go to the state hospital, but of course there were no beds. According to authorities, William Weaver Jr. jumped from this top bunk bed, cracking his skull and breaking his neck. He is now a quadriplegic who needs hospitalization to stay alive. Oh, the father is devastated. Totally ruined his father, too. Imagine. I mean, it's, it's, it's the harsh reality of that place. Bill's father, William Weaver Sr., who had just left his son's hospital bed. Do you think anything has come from what the incidents of what your son went through? Nothing. Nothing's changed. Do I think something could change? I don't know. I don't know. It's time. It's time something changed. In fact, nearly all the problems the inmates told me about have been documented for years. On my visit, many were concerned about open sores on their naked bodies. There's so many infectious diseases that you can get inside of this cell, ma'am, you wouldn't believe it. They're human beings, damn it. And, and they have a right to live with a certain amount of equality, of quality of care. Tom Mullen, mental health advocate and director of a Miami crisis intervention halfway house that is an alternative to floor nine. And you've got empty rooms and unused beds. Yes. Does it make any sense? No. Despite volatile overcrowding at the jail, rooms and beds go unused less than a mile away at a secure treatment facility specializing in care for people with mental illnesses who've been arrested. Some advocates say it's an example of bureaucratic red tape holding help hostage. Community activist Renee Tarola. And here we have a facility right now that has 38 beds and can only use 16 because of the rules and the laws that they have put in. So when you look at an empty room like this, it's ridiculous. Conditions on floor 9 are expected to get worse. Recent changes in Medicaid are reducing benefits to the tune of tens of millions of dollars, according to Lightman, and backlogging help for the most in need. Inmates with mental illnesses must now navigate the HMO system in order to be treated. And while local dollars have now been earmarked for a psychiatric treatment facility for inmates, the doors are not slated to be open for another. Years. So short term, how do you deal with this crisis? Well, we're stuck for a while. I don't have an easy answer. We're going to need money to have treatment, and we can't do it overnight, and we can't just send these people back to the street. It's going to put them at risk, and it's going to put the community at risk, and we're not going to put the community at risk. Leaving early, whose own son was diagnosed with mental illness and sketched in this self-portrait, to wonder what it will take to end the nightmare on floor nine. All those people on the night before were, had parents. Maybe they gave up on them. Maybe they got burned out. But they're human beings, and they deserve uh, our compassion, and they deserve better than what they're getting. And the people of Miami are better than what that jail shows. So it took Judge Leifman 12 years, but now... Miami-Dade is seen as a gold standard, and people from across the country are going there studying how he changed that whole system. It takes a leader, it takes a champion, it takes someone with authority to make everybody come together and unify them, and if they do that, then they can change a whole community. And that's a sign of what had been, and I, unfortunately I don't have a tape of what it is today, but it's fabulous today, so thank you very much. So, Joe, 
Jetson is going to take over from now and moderate. We've got an incredible panel. There. Everybody's going to talk to you for five minutes, but me, I'm going to keep my mouth shut, and then we'll take questions. Joe Jetson. Good evening. So all of you have programs, and what I'd like you to do, instead of me reading to you, you can learn all about the people. And when you introduce yourselves, maybe tell a little bit about why you're here and what your passion is that brought you here. And I have to say, um, Pete, <laughs> there are no words. And um, thank you so much for what you're doing. Um, it's kind of a, yep. Okay, so I'm Jenny Gruenberg. I am the Youth Outreach Coordinator for NAMI Washington. Um, and I'm here as an advocate for youth and young people and about early um, education and diversion away from being in crisis, um, from uh, sort of working to get people educated early. So that's, that's my platform and why I'm so passionate about working to divert people away from um, the criminal justice system. Uh, my name is Rachel Sievers and I'm an attorney with Disability Rights Washington. I work in our AVID program, which focuses on people with disabilities in prisons and jails across the state. Um, so that is why I'm here, because I go mostly into our state prisons and the Special Commitment Center on McNeil Island. Hi, good evening everyone. My name is Kim Mozoff. I am also an attorney with Disability Rights Washington. I, walk, I work with Rachel. Um, initially, I focused on our jails in the state and spent a lot of time on um, the seventh floor of the King County Jail, which is the equivalent of the ninth floor that you just saw there, Miami-Dade. Um, and a couple years ago, I switched gears and now I focus, um, continue to work on issues of mental illness in jail, but I focus on our treatment facilities because Washington State continues to have you uh, rely on the large institution model for psychiatric, psychiatric care. We have two very large state psychiatric hospitals, and so I spend a lot of my time focusing on conditions there and um, also working on issues of criminalization of mental illness. My name is Shalisha. Um, I am a student and an employee of Post-Prison Education Program. Um, I'm here because I work with a lot of students who are S codes, one, two, three, four, five, and before I started working with Ari, I had no idea what an S code was. And so I'm here because of that, and also because my life has been impacted by my little brother who struggles with um, a serious mental illness. Um, he's right now downtown, he's been there for a month. I haven't seen him, so that's why I'm here. I'll, uh, instead of uh, why I'm here, it's maybe why we put this event together. Um, I, uh, I know there's a solution to this. In my mind, it all goes back to money. Money all goes back to the Washington State Legislature. I've got close friends in this room um, who have really, uh, uh, you know, strong adversarial positions against the Department of Corrections. I think the fault lies with the legislature. Um, and, and so I want to find, I want to bring people together, build coalitions, and force the legislature to fund uh, solutions because people are dying. Uh, one a couple years ago, uh, Mark Stern was Assistant Secretary of the Health Division of the Department of Corrections. And now he's a research professor with the University of Washington down in, uh, he lives in Olympia still. And he did a morbidity study in 2007 and then he and another medical doctor updated it in 2013. And along with seeing people whose lives are just like Jeremy Polston, um, that morbidity study really sort of drove me crazy. So Washington's a really small state, but 70 men and women are dying from overdose and suicide every year 
within less than two years of their release. Former prisoners find reentry so impossibly difficult that they're dying from overdose and suicide within less than two years. Nationally, that's 5,000. That's what they found in 2007, and then they confirmed it in 2013. So when people, some people um, think I'm over the top um, with what some people call passion, be it's more anger, um, but people are dying, and that's not acceptable. And they're dying unnecessarily, and that's murder. So we'll take questions. We've got till 9.30, and there's some amazing panelists to my left and my right. Uh, there's a microphone there, and there's a microphone there. Uh, and invite you to come up. Some of, some of the work that's been done in the state uh, is extraordinarily remarkable, and um, and, I, and and Rachel and Kim have at Disability Rights Washington have, have, have done a lot of that. Uh, Pete's done it nationally. Shalisha does it in our office. Jenny's doing it with you. So I hope you'll take advantage and have a conversation with these panelists. Thank you. I have a question. If each of you could tell us what one thing this audience could do to maybe make a change, to maybe participate in making that difference, what would it be? Um, so speaking on behalf of NAMI, I think part of our mission is to work to decrease stigma around mental health and mental illness. Um, and so as you've heard in the presentation today, mental illness is something that can happen to anyone um, at any time unexpectedly, but in a lot of cases, the mental health condition will make itself known um, in the early 20s, late 30s. So educating young people, educating yourselves and letting other people know that um, Mental health is something that we can all um, accept and support, and sort of NAMI works to build a community around mental illness. So the de the destigmatization of it is incredibly important. So being able to talk about it with your friends, your peers, your children, normalizing the experience of mental health is one thing that will start to shift the culture in a major way. Um, I think sharing what you know. Similarly. Um, the, the video up here struck me because the, oftentimes people say it's forgotten or we've lost, you know, it's lost. And I, I don't know that it's we forget. I think it's that you can't see behind the walls in the prisons and you can't see behind the jails. Um, and that's on purpose, right? And there are videos on our website of the jails here. Um, so it's not confined to one state or one jail. Um, and you guys know that it's a big deal, right? You're here. Um, but I think that it's really easy for people to sort of forget what's behind a wall that they don't see. And so it doesn't make you a fun party guest <laughs> to, to tell people about it. But it's really important because I think you are a small number of people who know what is happening and care what's happening. And then to Ari's point, to use that knowledge to vote. Um, because it's on the legislature, but it's also on us to hold them accountable, to ask them to do the things like fund community-based housing, like fund re-entry programs, like fund higher education and in prisons, doing the things that really do lead to successful re-entry. Um, and so pressuring them to do those things, I think, is, is a collective action. Hmm. There's just so many things I think we spend our hours doing, but I think um, being relentless in a demand for decency and humanity from our state legislatures is, is important. And the way that I think they can do that most effectively is to continue funding some things that they have only recently decided they need to start funding. And I, I want to say that's because that they um, uh, felt suddenly had a change of heart, but I think it's because they were bleeding money in lawsuits, um, one of which I spent a lot of time working on called the True Blood lawsuit, um, and they were given an opportunity to stop bleeding money through contempt fines and instead to start thinking about how to use that money to stand up new programs or fully fund some programs that have been demonstrating success for a while in communities, and those programs are aimed at um, 
early intervention, at trying to prevent arrest, at trying to reach out and ensure people are getting the kinds of services they need at the right time in the right place, as opposed to waiting until they hit some sort of crisis point and putting them in the ER or in jail. So last year, um, the legislature made some legislative changes, some changes to the law that were necessary, but they also put about $40 million towards um, starting up some of these programs in some key counties, Pierce, Clark, uh, Spokane, um, and then in next biennium will be King County. So they did it this, this biennium, and to ensure that they continue to do that is going to require all of us holding them accountable. Um, I think that the most important thing that you can do is when you see someone on the street is just acknowledge them. Don't turn your nose up to them or judge them. Um, you don't know what someone's going through, and just being acknowledged can help someone. Um, it broke my heart when my brother said that people treat him like he's a piece of garbage on the ground. So just to maybe acknowledge somebody on the streets. Don't ever underestimate the power of your voice. When I talk to state legislators, I have given up the emotional high ground because someone else is going to come in the next day and they're going to be asking for money for better police services, better, J uh, better schools, for breast awareness. All those are worthy causes. The advantage you have with our criminal justice system is that you can argue about the money. Uh, years ago, the New Yorker ran a thing called Million Dollar Murray about how a homeless person cost that community a million dollars. It cost you about 36000 the last time I checked in Washington to keep somebody with jail. That's not very much. But most services, if you can group them together and you have housing first and an ACT team where people actually go help people, can be done for about three-fourths of what it costs even to keep somebody in jail. And if you add the collaborative things in, all the cost of untreated mental illness the Washington Post did a story about 911 calls, and because we're so efficient in Washington, D.C., every time someone does a 911 call, it literally costs, and they respond, it costs $500. The number one person who did it was a guy with schizophrenia. He called 144 times simply because he wanted to talk to somebody and needed a ride somewhere. And that's kind of the undocumented. But there's a group called the Perryman Group, in Texas who did the economic forecast on it and they said if a community pays one dollar in helping divert and housing first and act they will save seven dollars overall those are the kind of numbers that wake up state legislators because you go in and you say you're spending the money now but you're not getting any results uh, 85 percent recidivism rate the lamp project in LA has an 80 percent recovery rate now, which would you rather be doing? And you can talk numbers that way to them, but don't ever forget this, you know. If your state le representative, your local person, gets two calls about something, they pay a little attention. If they get 10 calls, and that literally is all it takes, 10 calls, they get alarmed because people just don't call up your state legislature that much. You know, you got a homeless problem here. And you gotta make sure that the solution is one that is humane and helps people and just doesn't sweep people up off the street and throw them in jail. Um, you know, one, I wanna say one thing in reference to what Pete just said. The most we've ever spent on a single person was $17,000. Uh, they made a movie about her, Shelley Clear, and it was a documentary that aired at Benaroya Hall two months ago. But the most we ever, and we worked with her for years. Uh, and so rent, tuition, books, housing, groceries, all of that uh, to get her and her kids and her husband into a safe place, 17 grand and, and versus $35,440 a year to keep them locked up, and that doesn't count prosecution. So if you can get a legislator to talk dollars and cents with you, then, then, then for God's sakes, have that conversation because the numbers are there. But I'll tell you, I think the greater problem in terms, first of all, there aren't many foundations on all of Earth that can, that can fund this, the solution to this because the numbers are too great. 
they're just extraordinarily high. It takes, it's, it takes government. Uh, and that's where you run into what I call legislative cowardice. So I'll tell a, a long story short, it, because this is what I think has to be overcome. So for many, 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 many years, as you know, Frank Chop was Speaker of the House. And for more than 10 of those years, Macon Ryherd was his chief of staff. And people, even going back to when I worked at the Senate, people used to say, refer to her as being like the person who sat at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, because nothing was going to happen at the legislature other if Frank didn't go along with it. So Mike and retired and went to work for her dad's lobbying firm, and she's a neighbor of mine, and, and I sent her a Facebook message, and I said, let's get together. And, and I, we met at a coffee shop, and I'm like, I showed her an email that I'd gotten from Eldon Vale, who used to be secretary of the Department of Corrections. And, and, and uh, it dealt with legislative cowardice. And what had happened with the email was uh, Warren Buffett's sister, Doris, had a foundation, which was a large funder of ours until she devolved into dementia. And at the start of our relationship, they uh, looked at our finances and they said that it was pretty clear that we didn't have sustained funding and, and they wanted me to address that. So I spent a month talking to people from one end of the country to the other because I needed to give them an honest but truthful but positive upbeat answer. And I finally settled on a paragraph. And the paragraph discussed legislative cowardice, and, and basically it, it told Doris Buffett and her director, Betty Beal, that post-secondary education, which has been the most successful thing with reducing recidivism of all, um, wasn't funded by the state for the same reason that there would be no classes, college classes taught in the Washington State Penitentiary or Coyote Ridge Correction Center, but for Doris paying for it. And, and that reason was legislative cowardice. So I sent that email to Eldon when he was on the governor. He was a member of the cabinet, and he was also secretary of DOC. And I said, is this a fair statement? Is it, is it fair to say that legislators are responsible for uh, the best, the most effective recidivism reducing mechanism not being funded? And three days later, he wrote me back as a member of the governor's cabinet. He said, yeah, that's a fair statement. So what I asked Mike and Ryherd <coughs> at the coffee shop that day was, you know, can legislative cowardice be overcome? And her response to me was, not in my lifetime and not in yours. So finding a way to overcome Richard Nixon's tough on crime, soft on crime, finding a way to get past legislators valuing their, you know, they only make forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year. They, they get these piddly ass jobs, but they get to wander around in these marble palaces and be treated like kings and queens for a couple months a year, doing nothing important. But finding a way to get them past legislative cowardice is, is really the key because they're the ones that hold the purse strings and it takes money. And I can tell you're itching. Yeah. So uh, the federal government has a program. It's called Stepping Up Campaign. And what it does is it's all about jail diversion, getting people out of jails and prisons. King County, right here, right? King yeah, County? Yeah. Passed a resolution. It's one of 17 counties in Washington that endorsed Stepping Up. So you should find out after passing this resolution, King County County Commissioners, is that who runs your county? Yeah. yeah. They said, we're all in favor of stepping up. So you should find out where your sheriff, your police chief, and what those commissioners are actually doing because they passed a resolution, they signed up, and they said, we're gonna divert people from our jails and prisons. And they're on record doing that. So I'd be curious whether they, uh, they're doing it. Hi, we have a question over here. Oh, is that on? Yep, it's on. Yeah. I want to, it's kind of piggybacking off of um, your comment. I'm interested in knowing which agencies 
uh, police agencies or prosecutor's offices are open to um, essentially what the goal is tonight. Um, and if there are specific agencies that have an issue with addressing this problem, what is the issue? Let me, let me talk on the national level first and then you guys answer in the state if you don't mind. The biggest drivers in the last 10 years uh, for getting people out of jails and prisons haven't been advocates like me. They've been sheriffs and police chiefs and judges. They have been the National Sheriff's Association, all these folks. But we've reached a tipping point now. And that tipping point is they've been beaten up so badly that now, just in Alabama, they had a jail de declared a mental health treatment facility. So they're beginning to get rid of ninth floor, but what they're doing then is building a mental health center in their jail, and you don't want that. You want people treated well, but you shouldn't have to get arrested to get decent mental health care. It's the wrong way to go. But those folks are people who, you, in your community, you should have, uh, you know, I don't know if there's any police chiefs or sheriffs, or, but they have an incentive to get people out of their jails and prisons, and so you should try to, to team with them. And the other big thing, and I know it's big in King County, and I can't say it, Kitsnap? Yeah, <laughs> is crisis intervention team trained officers. It, it's mandatory, your state legislature passed a law about it, but they're doing that to protect themselves from lawsuits. But if you're a parent, you want a crisis intervention team trained officer coming through that door, you don't want Rambo. And so most, listen, I try to tell reporters, they go, go to your police chief and your sheriff and you're gonna find an ally. You're not gonna find an enemy. They want this problem resolved. So, and I don't know about locally what you run into, but. There's, you, you can find the right people. The last thing I'll say, I promise, is if you're gonna go to the police chief, look, you wanna affect your state legislature? Find somebody who has, one of those legislators who has a brother, sister, cousin, who has a mental problem. Yes. Then you'll get results. Um, that's a great question. I think, um, You'll find sort of varying degrees of openness to this idea of diversion from all of the elected county prosecutors. Um, and WAPA is the state sort of membership organization for all of those county prosecutors. And so they take stances on things. We worked with them last legislative session to get some things passed. Um, I think there is a lot of common ground there. Um, in King County particularly, um, you may have seen in the press, there's been sort of the Seattle is dying report that I could talk about for hours, but um, I think um, they, the Seattle City Prosecutor and the King County Prosecutor have sort of come out and, to their credit, defended some of the, the diversion practices that they've been practicing along in spite of this criticism that's been popping up. But um, I think uh, we have found at, at Disability Rights Washington um, an open ear at the King County Jail, um, which is a very large mental health treatment facility, unfortunately, mainly on the seventh floor. Um, and I think that there is willingness there through jail health services here at the county and through um, the jail itself to improve um, access to care there and to reduce the use of restrictive housing. Again, it comes down to funding and what the county is willing to put, what money the county is willing to put towards that. On the state level, you know, we mainly when we sue folks in the state, it's DSHS. Um, and now the healthcare authority, because a lot of the behavioral health services that we deliver in the state have now been are transferring over from, or were transferred over from DSHS now to the healthcare authority. So those are the two big state entities that we are constantly hammering on, aside from DOC, Rachel is suing more often than I am. Um, and I think there's, again, a, a willingness there, but a, um, a huge problem and a lot of the challenge that we or the excuses that we get has to do with funding um, if you have questions about other specific localities we can definitely talk to you about those I think we have had experience in pretty much all the major counties now with the jail systems with the police systems oh and to your point um, um, Pete about the training we did pass in the state um, a law that requires eight hours in a six-month training course of, of crisis intervention team training it's a start, it ain't a lot. Um, what we did last session in relationship to the True Blood case was to um, pack on 
um, the 40-hour course, which is a full week of CIT for certain jurisdictions that I mentioned earlier. And then also some of you might have heard of the Initiative 940 that passed last year and, and Disability Rights Washington was active in. That also pushed for increased amounts of training, um, not necessarily the CIT model, but training that focused on de-escalation tactics and mental health training specifically. So that's going to increase the, the annual retraining that you get as well. And I hate to do this, <laughs> but it's 9 o'clock, oh, and I want to get one more question in. Are we fine? Okay. <laughs> nope, behind you. Is that all right? <laughs> Thank you. By Hi. Way, by the way, you should get CIT training for your judges and your prosecutors. Oh. And our corrections officers. Very much so. Mm. Hi. Hi. Um, so I know you guys talked a lot about like funding and how that's a really large part of like the problem, but I kind of wanted to talk about with respect to like the school to prison pipeline and how the implementation of conversations around like mental health could like improve or like kind of fix that pipeline and like do you think starting these earlier and schooler like the conversations around mental health could like reduce like the future like um, like kids going to like detention centers and everything? Yes, I think absolutely. I think that the education and um, that early intervention is a real key towards um, working to normalize the experience of mental health among young people and diverting them away from this prison to school pipeline, which is very real and does exist, um, contrary to what some people may say. Um, I also think that it, um, the schools are moving in a direction of really wanting to include social emotional learning, trauma informed care. Um, that is being integrated into the curriculums, which I think is sort of dovetailing with this mental health um, curriculum that is also work, sort of being worked into the general curriculums for schools. So, um, from my experience working in the schools, there is a lot of movement towards working to educate the whole person. Um, there's also a, a movement right now to get school-based health centers so that students can receive both primary and mental health care in the schools. Um, so I think that the movement and the momentum is there, and I think it will help to um, alleviate the school-to-prison pipeline in some respects. Again, change is slow, but I think that there is a shift in that direction, absolutely. There's also um, the Conserved Lifers organization up at Monroe is an inmate-led group. Um, at Monroe, which is the closest prison to Seattle, and they actually have a project that's focused on the foster care to prison pipeline, which to me is, a, is an even more sort of extreme version of the school to prison pipeline, because these are, peop these are, these are kids who are in state care, by definition are in state care. Um, and the statistics that they, are, that they are bringing out at the CLO, the Concerned Lifers, um, are sort of horrifying in terms of the, it's the vast majority of people who come out of foster care are incarcerated at some point and the small minority graduate from high school. Uh, it's, it's like a terrifying pipeline. Um, and I was sort of floored at their conference when they, when they talked about this project that they have that's really focused on identifying ways to intervene and work with kids in foster care so that they're not in that pipeline. Um, but as far as pressure on the state, these are people in state care who they are completely failing. Um, so it's just another extension of that school to prison pipeline that I think is really needs attention right now. Too. Okay. <laughs> so it's nine o'clock. Um, I guess, you know, why am I up here? And um, many of you picked this up, and this is my nephew. And the phoenix is composed of three words, hope, education, and opportunity, which if this was larger, you would see those are the only three words that have created this graphic. 18 years locked up to pay for my mistakes. It is never too late to turn things around. I paid my debt. I will not be held back by the judgment of others. I will prosper, have a positive impact on society in which I live. Like the phoenix, I will rise from the ashes of my former existence and be reborn. I shall rise above. Joey was three or four class, um, in and out of jail, three times self-medicating, mental illness, um, family gets exhausted. And um, his last day at Walla Walla, he discovered post-prison. They helped him realize that he was self-medicating and to self-medicate, he had to create crimes. And so he started taking a good look at himself and realizing that we could turn this around. 
and if it wasn't for post-prison, he wouldn't have. Um, Dean's List, um, found joy for the first time in his life. And joy is a huge thing, as you guys talked about, of being believed in and feeling like there's a future. So that's why I'm here, because I watched his life get turned around. Sadly, his dad had died of ALS, and Joe started showing signs of ALS, and he took his life. Sorry, guys. But he went out full of joy and um, knowing what life could really be because somebody believed in him. So this is what I do. I get up and I cry. <laughs> I don't think it will ever end. So all of you got this envelope, and I wish that there was more we could do that didn't involve money, but there isn't. And when the prisons let people out and they're still wearing khakis and they have no money and they have no food and they have nothing, no matter what your budget is and what you do, it isn't enough. And so there's just, I mean, if you look, if you can't do any more, but if you could help with a bus pass, or if you could help with housing or anything, it would be so appreciated to help. And that's one of the ways you can make a difference. And I thank you so much, all of you, for being here tonight. So, I'm a fan.